This is Paul Tilsley, and as a fellow journalist, I've known Yusuf Abramji, covered stories alongside him for more than two decades in South Africa. And my curiosity was piqued a few months ago when I received the first of what turned out to be hundreds of tweets from him from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as he experienced his journey through the Hajj. I was delighted when he came back home when he decided to put his experiences that he'd taken with, with his camera phone his experiences into a coffee table book. But being a person who works in the world of television, I was also still curious to find out really what it was like from a television perspective to be uh, in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj. And therefore, I decided to try and assist to uh, come here to this beautiful mosque in Houghton and to spend the day with, uh, with Yusuf and ask him to help me bring the pages of this book alive. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Yusuf Abramji and I'm here to share with you the journey of a lifetime. Hajj 2016 or in Islamic calendar, Hajj 1437. As you know, it is compulsory on every Muslim to undertake Hajj, the pilgrimage, at least once in your lifetime. I undertook this journey this year, and what a remarkable journey. Together with some friends, I compiled a photo journal or a coffee table book, and I'm here to share my story. Leading the team is Yassine Teba, who had the idea for the book. When Yusuf returned from Hajj, he asked me to download his thousand images onto a hard drive. I would not accept that these images would just be downloaded and, and, and stored. It was an honor and privilege to compile these photos into a coffee table book. We hope that this book uh, will start up conversations around Hajj. Everyone seeing the book relates to images, uh, relates to their experiences in their Hajj trip. We also hope that this book will educate non-Muslims on what true Islam is. We hear lots of negatives about Islam in the media and we hope that this book will educate people and show people that Islam is about unity, about peace and about patience. Art director Mohammed Ismail had the difficult job of deciding which of the more than 1,000 images available should go into the book. I've never been on Hajj, but this book helped me through the journey. I had my wife sit by my side and go through every aspect of the Hajj, from, from the beginning up until the end during those five, five days. And as I was beginning editing the book and going through the colors and everything that demanded the attention of getting the book to its fine quality that it is right now. I realized that Yusuf's journey became my journey. And the things that he saw through his camera, I started seeing. I started seeing the emotions in people's eyes. I started seeing the journey, water being poured over people, and I understood what Yusuf went through. Putting this book together has been a great and an enormous pleasure. Um, and I hope that while paging through the books, you get to experience the same things that Yusuf experienced through the Hajj, the same things that I experienced while going through the book. It is a dream of every Muslim, whether you are a good Muslim, whether you are a bad Muslim, whether you are religious, whether you are not religious, to undertake the Hajj. Our religion compels us to go on this journey if you can afford it. And from a very young age, whether you're five years or six years old, every Muslim starts dreaming of going to the Holy Land in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to perform your Hajj, which is the event that takes place every year, once a year. Well, a number of factors drive uh, anyone to go for Hajj. Uh, for me, it was a combination. First of all, a spiritual duty, a religious obligation. Secondly, when you see the photographs, when you hear people talking about Hajj, you want to be part of those millions of people, being part on the plains of Arafat, going to Mina, uh, doing your, your, your tawaf around the Holy Kaaba. And that is what Muslims want to do. It is being part of the, of the collective to go on this journey, to be part of the rituals, and to make sure that your spiritual duty and your personal journey is accomplished. Allah. Oh, no. 
There are a lot of uh, different perceptions about Hajj. Uh, we know that historically there have been stampedes, there have been fires, there have been floods, and even the one year there was a bomb attack. And that is why many pilgrims go to the Holy Land uh, with anxiety, with anxiousness, with fear. Um, I decided not to go for Hajj classes this year because uh, information overload can be a problem. Many people go to Molanas, they go to religious leaders to explain what Hajj is all about. And I decided to take it day by day. And as I undertook this journey, I had the various questions for the religious leaders and I asked them to explain to me in great detail the significance of the rituals that we undertake. And that is exactly how I undertook my Hajj. I know very often people get anxious, people get nervous before they go for Hajj. And I think my lesson from my Hajj this year was be cool, be calm, be collected and just go with the flow. For most pilgrims, uh, you make your intention uh, to go for the pilgrimage months or even years before you undertake the journey. Weeks before you even uh, booked your ticket and your hotel accommodation, uh, you are somewhat anxious. But I think the real uh, message really sinks in. When you get your visa physically in your hand, in your passport, uh, when you go to the airport, when you greet all your family and friends, and the minute you sit in the plane, and as the plane takes off to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, then you realize this journey has now become a reality. Is you on the flight, a lot of emotion. You anxious, you nervous, you happy, you sad. These mixed emotions really is what every pilgrim goes through going on the Hajj. As you arrive in the kingdom and the plane door opens and you're on the tarmac ready to be taken to the Hajj terminal, you realize that Hajj is only days away. Your dream has now become a reality. You are filled with joy. The tears of joy flow. But at the same time, you are so anxious not knowing what the five days of Hajj will hold. And you only pray that you'll be able to perform the rituals in safety, in security, but more importantly, that the Almighty will accept your prayers and give you an accepted Hajj. I tweeted a photograph, and within a few minutes, uh, my dear friend Ashraf Garda, media personality, sent me a message to say, I love your tweets, why don't you start the hashtag Abramji on Hajj or Hajj 2016? I then decided to uh, document my entire journey through social media platforms using those hashtags. So whether I was in Jidda, whether I was in Medina, whether I was in Mecca or the plains of Arafat, I took photographs on my iPhone, I tweeted it, and that is why uh, a month after I returned, we launched the coffee table book of photo journal, a high class A3 landscape with over 400 photographs of Hajj 2016 or Hajj 1437. The first thing many South Africans do is we go to the holy city of Medina. This is where the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is laid to rest. As you uh, fly over the city of Medina, about to land uh, at the Medina International Airport, you can see from the plane's window the massive floodlights, the white glare uh, filling the night sky. Uh, that is the Grand Mosque. You drive through the streets of Medina, very peaceful, very tranquil. And when you see the mosque, the, the Prophet's mosque for the first time, you realize the magnitude of this building. You, re you realize how important it is for you to be there. Hundreds of thousands of people are there. Medina never sleeps. Uh, people stream in and out of the mosque. People queue uh, to go and, and greet the Holy Prophet. <laughs> The Prophet's Mosque in Medina is massive. It can hold hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, there's a portion in the Grand Mosque uh, where people go and it's significant for us to pray on that piece of, of carpet, uh, which we believe in our religion is a piece of paradise, a piece of Jannah. 
You go there and you go to the tomb of the beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, and that is where we make salam, or you greet the Holy Prophet, and you ask him through the Almighty to intercede on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. People become very emotional, people cry, people are, uh, cry with joy, and really you then turn to the Almighty and you ask him that uh, he allows our beloved Prophet to really intercede on our behalf. The, the real feeling uh, of the pilgrimage then sets in. You realize that you are now here, that you are now standing in front of uh, the prophet, uh, our leader, our, our person that we look up to, uh, uh, follow his ways of life. Uh, and, and it is so important for Muslims, so emotional for Muslims, as you stand there and you pray to the Almighty and you ask the prophet to intercede on your behalf of the day of judgment, that you get this feeling that uh, this is now a dream come true. Uh, next to the mosque, uh, alongside the mosque in Medina, is Janatul Baki, the cemetery, where many of the family members of our beloved prophet is laid to rest. And as you walk through the cemetery, uh, all the graves are, are, are the same. No tombstones, just a piece of, uh, of soil, pebbles around. You find the doves uh, flying around. Everyone is equal. All the graves are, 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 are similar. Um, and then you realize that when you, when you leave the world, uh, no one is superior. We are all equal. People go there and pray 24-7. And it is a dream of every Muslim. Uh, and it is our prayer that the day we leave the world, let us die in the holy city of Medina and be buried amongst the people in Janatul Baki because we believe and our religion teaches us that people that are buried there, there's great significance and that the doors of paradise are open to you. The minute you take your, your, your right foot and you step into the Prophet's mosque, you now realize that you are following in the footsteps of our beloved Prophet. This is where hundreds of years ago, our beloved Prophet began his journey. This is the home of our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him. This is the place where Islam to a large extent was born and developed. This is the center of the religion of Islam to a very large extent. The emotion fills you. You are filled with joy that you are now here in the Prophet's mosque. You are filled with sadness and you keep on praying to the Almighty to bring you back to the Prophet's mosque over and over again. You want the Prophet to intercede on your behalf on the day of judgment. You keep on praying. The tears run down your face. You keep on asking the Almighty to accept your prayer because every step you take in that Prophet's mosque is following in the footsteps of the Prophet, peace be upon him. At this time, you have a lot of introspection. You think about your life. You think about your journey. You think about the Prophet's journey and what he sacrificed for. You think about the Prophet's companions. And then the message really sinks in. What is life all about? What a great sacrifice from people like our beloved Prophet and his companions and his family members. And that is where we all pray to the Almighty to say, we want to follow in the footsteps of our beloved Prophet. From here in Medina, like we traditionally do, we go on uh, ziyarats or what is called a tour. This is all the historical sites uh, in the city of Medina, be it the first mosque, be it the mosque where the Prophet prayed, be it some of the wells, uh, be it the battle of, uh, uh, of Uhud, uh, be it all the other historical sites. And when you go on this touring and the religious leaders or the tour guides give you the Islamic history, it brings back a lot of memories. As young children in the schools, in the madrasas, we were taught about the Islamic history. 
المستأخرين نسأل الله لكم السلامة والعافية Walking in the streets of Medina makes your religion come to life. You try to visualize how hundreds of years ago, uh, where Islam to a large extent began, uh, and where the Prophet lived for, for many, many years, how they lived and how this religion developed over the years. This is the city, uh, the second most holiest city for Muslims in the world. You realize the importance of the city. And this is for the first time for many Muslims where your religion to a large extent comes to life. You now realize that our religion began here to a very large extent. Uh, and as you walk through or you drive through the city of Medina, what a peaceful feeling, what a tranquil city. You just feel that calmness. You feel the significance of being in this holy city. And very, very importantly for Muslims, you feel at home. When you leave Medina, you are dressed in two pieces of white cloth called the Ahram. We're now going towards uh, Makkah, the holy city, the most holiest city for Muslims in the world, to perform our Umrah or the mini pilgrimage. When you come to the holy city, you then enter the Grand Mosque and you walk towards the holy Kaaba, which is the center of Islam. The minute you set your eyes for the first time on the holy Kaaba, you lift your hands and you pray to the Almighty. You first of all thank him for bringing you to his house. You thank him for bringing you to the holy city. And that is where we believe the more you pray, your prayers will be answered. We ask that our sins be forgiven, we pray for ourselves, our families, we pray for humanity, we pray for peace. Such a feeling when you see the Kaaba for the first time. This is the place where you can be in any part of the world. Five times a day, we, we all face the same direction. And two or three words unite millions of Muslims throughout the world. It is Allah Akbar. Allah is great. Whether you're in the Amazon jungle, whether you're in the Caribbean, whether you're in the most southern part of Africa, Every Muslim five times a day, when you pray, you turn towards the holy city of Mecca and you face towards the Kaaba. And now you are in, in front of the Kaaba. What a dream come true. You are filled with joy. Your tears roll with joy. And that is where you turn to the Almighty and you pray, you pray, and you pray more. The minute you see the Kaaba, you pray, you lift your hands, you then perform what we call the Tawaf. You walk seven times in an anti-clockwise direction around the Holy Kaaba. And despite the large crowds, one tries to make your way towards the Holy Kaaba. The significance of putting your hand on the Holy Kaaba is so important. You now realize that you are physically touching the house of the Almighty. What a dream come true. People stand there, people keep on praying, and the longer you can hold your hand on the marble or the walls of the Kaaba, the more peace you feel. All our life, uh, we face the Holy Kaaba, we pray five times a day. Um, when you're there and you're now physically touching the Kaaba, you can feel a, a sense of electrification almost, trampling your body, because you are now physically touching the same building that you've been praying or facing towards for, for, for many, many years. Before I undertook uh, the Hajj journey, many religious people told me, try to do three things when you're on Hajj. Firstly, make salam or greet as many people as you can. Secondly, try to feed as many people as you can during the Hajj period. And thirdly, be kind to everyone. Those words resonated with me throughout the Hajj journey. When we in Mecca, staying in our lovely hotels, Five times a day, you take a few steps towards the Grand Mosque where hundreds of thousands of people gather and you see people sleeping on the marble floors. People are begging for food and for money. People are queuing outside takeaways looking for food. Um, a fellow Haji uh, from South Africa and I then decided to donate a few Saudi Riyals. We bought some food. 
a number of South African pilgrims then joined us and within 24 hours we raised about 250,000 rand to buy food, to buy food hampers and we fed almost 9,000 destitute pilgrims over a five-day period. During the Hajj period we bought a truckload of milk and, and juice and let's not forget that during this, uh, during this period of Hajj the temperatures uh, this time of the year is around about 48 to 50 degrees in the kingdom people get thirsty, people get dehydrated, but we decided to feed hundreds of destitute pilgrims from all over the world because charity is part of our religion. Charity is also part of Hajj. And when you go to the holy city of Mecca and you see people coming to the holy city, living on the street sometimes, living in one-star hotels, in sometimes bad conditions, it is your duty as a Muslim to try to help these people and to make a difference. And that is why we as South African pilgrims decided to work together, decided to collect some money and feed these destitute pilgrims. People come there to perform their Hajj, but people also come there with a limited budget. Many people don't know where the next meal is going to come from. I come from Niger, Africa, West Africa. Do you think the distributed Africa. food uh, is part from South Africa's uh, it's contribution? Good, uh, what is con my contribution is... Uh, uh, people uh, is good because uh, no money to buy. Today it's hot. It's a uh, brother to give uh, 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 people Jazakallah uh, khairan. Okay, God will the paradise, inshallah. 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 We are now days away from Hajj. Many pilgrims move to the outskirts to the suburb of Azizia which is closer to where the pilgrimage or the Hajj starts. By the hour, you see more and more pilgrims coming, arriving uh, and preparing for the Hajj. The Hajj normally attracts millions of people from every part of the globe. People from around the world converge to come for the annual pilgrimage. Preparations are well underway. Emergency services, when you go and you see the uh, plains of Arafat or whether you go to the tent city of Mina, you'll find security preparations underway. People are now excited. The, the air is filled with excitement. People are preparing for this very important period, the five days of Hajj. Uh, you realize that the Hajj is a massive operation. It's nothing compared to the Olympic Games. It's nothing compared to the FIFA World Cups that we see. Here you have millions of people converging uh, at one place at one given time over a period of, uh, of five days. It's Saturday morning, 4 a.m., we're in the hotel in Azizia on the outskirts of Mecca. The first day of Hajj has arrived. We perform our early morning prayers, the Fajr prayer. Uh, you then take a shower and you then dress yourself in the ihram, which is a two pieces of white cloth, unbranded, unstitched. Pilgrims then converge and we wait for the buses to arrive. The buses then arrive and we then make our way to Mina. When you arrive in Mina, you then realize that uh, Hajj is now underway. Mina is a tent city where millions of people converge. All you see is a sea of white, tent after tent after tent. We then go into the South African camp, uh, camp A, uh, and that is where you settle down. Um, you make yourself comfortable and you start praying. The whole day is then spent in Mina, where meals are served, a number of talks are given, people keep on praying, and then the evening you spend in Mina uh, in the tent. <laughs> The following morning, the Sunday morning, we then rise for the early morning prayers and immediately after the prayers we are now leaving for the most important day of Hajj, the day of Arafah. In fact, Hajj is Arafah. And that is where the pilgrims in their thousands now start making their way from Mina, the tent city, to, uh, to uh, the plains of Arafat, 
which is about 10 or 15 kilometers away. Many pilgrims decide to walk. In the extreme temperatures, they walk for kilometers uh, to make their way to Arafah. We're now on the bus, and that is where the so-called national anthem of the Hajj comes in. What an amazing feeling, where everyone chants, Labaik, Allahumma Labaik, Labaik la sharika laka Labaik, Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. And we are now proclaiming that Lord, I am here, I am here. Those words keep on being recited throughout the journey. And as you're going on the bus towards Arafah, you see people walking in their thousands towards uh, the uh, plains of Arafah. You arrive in Arafah, you settle down in your camp, and again, you start praying and praying. I decided to take a walk shortly after I arrived uh, in the camp in Arafah towards the mountain where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave his last sermon. When I arrived there, I saw thousands and thousands of people. You then lift your hands and you turn towards the Almighty and you ask Him and you pray and you thank Him for bringing you for this very important journey, the most important journey of your life. You see ambulance after ambulance arriving with people that are ill. Because even if you are for a few moments on, on Arafat, even if you are ill, your Hajj will probably be accepted. After midday prayers, the period of prayer then sets in. And all you do for the rest of the afternoon is that you pray and you pray. And we believe that praying on the day of Arafat, the Almighty will accept every prayer. That is how important the day of Arafat is. At sunset, we then prepare to leave for Musdalifa, which is just a few kilometers away. Uh, Musdalifa is an area largely open, and that is where you go. You settle down in Musdalifa, and you simply take your prayer mat or your sleeping mat, you throw it on the floor, and you then spend the night under the skies. It is often said, it's a night of a million stars. We then arrive back in Mina, and now you go and prepare for the pelting. You go to this massive concrete jungle called the Jamarat. And that is where symbolically we go and we pelt the devil. On this day of Hajj, you only pelt what we call the big Jamarat, the big Satan. You are filled with fear, you're filled with anxiety because you know historically many people have lost their lives uh, at the very same place, uh, the Jamrat, where there's a stampede. People crush each other, people wanting to, to complete their pelting because uh, the pelting is such an important part of the Hajj. Uh, luckily, with all the security arrangements, the safety arrangements, the Jamrat re resembles a massive parking lot uh, with about four or five levels. It has become so easy. You simply walk through, you do your pelting, and when you do, you take that pebble and you throw it towards uh, the, the large concrete uh, portion in the center of uh, this complex, you realize that uh, this is Satan. Uh, it is symbolic that we pelt Satan. And you go there and you walk towards uh, the big uh, Jamrat or the big Satan, and symbolically you, collect your, you take your pebbles that you collected in Musdalifa the night before, and then you throw the pebbles towards this large concrete pillar, which is symbolically the Satan. And the prayer is something to the effect, there's grace to Shaitan and pleasure for Rahman. Um, and that is where you find people again becoming very emotional because very often uh, Satan was the one that misled you. Satan was the one that made you do wrong. And now you are taking these pebbles and you are throwing it towards Satan. How symbolic indeed. From there, you then walk uh, back towards Azizia, uh, and you now have to go and uh, make sure that your sacrifice of an animal is done, the so-called kurbani, uh, in the Arabic word. And once you get word that uh, the animal has been slaughtered, you are now allowed to shave off your hair, 
You find everywhere people are shaving, in the streets, in the corners, in the hotels, people are shaving their hair. That is very, very symbolic uh, because it shows that you have now completed your rituals. You are now starting as a newborn baby. Your life is starting afresh. You are clean of all sins. And when you see your hair is now clean shaven, clean shaven, what an amazing feeling. You are now filled with inner joy, with inner peace, that you've completed your rituals, your hajj is almost complete, it's a new beginning. And once uh, you have shaven your hair, you are now allowed to take off your ihram and go back into your normal clothing. Let me at this point pick up on a few important issues around the hajj. Hajj is following in the footsteps of Prophet Abraham and some of the rituals that he did hundreds of years ago, and also the procedures and the Prophet Muhammad and how he conducted this very important journey. When we talk of the ahram, the two pieces of white cloth, it shows uniformity, it shows equality, it shows unity. The ahram is the so-called uniform of the Hajj. You see the sea of white, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pilgrims dressed in the so-called uniform. Next to you might be a judge from Kenya. On your left hand side might be a teacher from Ni Nigeria. Behind you might be an unemployed person from Jordan. In front of you might be a student from Sydney in Australia. There's no rich, there's no poor. There's no black, there's no white. Everyone is equal. We are all standing together as members of the humankind. We are all standing together united, and we're only praying towards one God. Now we return uh, to the city of Mecca to perform our tawaf uh, after the, on the third day of Hajj. Uh, when you go and again you return to the Kaaba, you walk in an anti-clockwise direction around the Kaaba. And let's not forget, it was Prophet Abram that built this Kaaba uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, and we Muslims believe that as we circling around the Kaaba, up in the heavens, the angels are also performing the, the tawaf. In fact, we believe 70,000 angels at every, every, any given time are busy walking around the, the Kaaba performing the, the tawaf. You then, after you've completed your tawaf, walk between the mountains of Safa and Marwa, a very important part of the pilgrimage. This is where the well of Zamzam is situated where even up to today, 1437 years later, water continues to pour out of the well. This water is running in its thousands and thousands of liters. We believe that water is very important. It's a healer. Uh, and this holy water then goes to all parts of the world where people use it and keep on praying. Before they drink the water, they keep on praying for beneficial knowledge. They keep on praying that this water also uh, help them, ease them of all their ailments. Uh, and after the, uh, the, the walking uh, seven times between Safa and Marwa, you then go back to Mina, you complete your two days of pelting, and the Hajj is now drawing to a close. You realize that this long journey that you've been dreaming for, for a large portion of your life, has come to an end. And all you do now is you ask the Almighty to give you an accepted Hajj. You keep on praying and uh, you're now preparing to make your journey back home. If anyone comes back from Hajj and you say that the Hajj had no effect on your life, something is wrong. To a very large degree, the Hajj ch changes your outlook towards life. You feel inner peace. You feel spirituality. And, and something in your life has to change. Uh, you become more closer to the Almighty. And now when you pray uh, five times a day, and you turn towards uh, the holy city of Mecca, towards the Kaaba. You try to picture yourself right in front of the Kaaba where a few days ago you were there. You touched the Kaaba. What a feeling. And that is the importance of Hajj, is to see how Hajj can change your life. You've come back as this newborn baby, free of all sin. And every time you want to commit a sin, you think about the day when you went and you threw that pebble at the Satan and you said, this grace with shaitan, pleasure for Rahman. And you try to keep away from sin, and you try to be a good Muslim. That is the importance of Hajj. As we now come towards the end of this Hajj journey, 
Thanks to television and thanks to my dear friend Paul Tilsley, let me remind you that this book is not only aimed at the Muslim community. It is aimed at Muslims and non-Muslims. For those people that have been on Hajj, the idea with Hajj 2016 is to bring back memories, to be a souvenir or a memento of this entire Hajj journey that you undertook. For Muslims who have not been on Hajj, the idea is to motivate you, to inspire you, to undertake this journey of a lifetime. For non-Muslims, it's about education, educating them what Islam is about. It's about educating them what Hajj is about. And as you page through the hundreds and hundreds of photographs in this book, whether it is the holy city of Mecca, whether it is Medina, whether it is Arafat, whether it is Mina, it is educational. The proceeds of this book are going towards two credible charities, Okaf South Africa and Crescent Lifestyle, for their Hajj funds or their Hajj workers. And the idea is to make it easy for people who have not been on, on Hajj, destitute people, to go and undertake this journey next year. And that is why all proceeds are going to these charities and the whole idea is to spread the message of goodwill and to make sure that people understand what Hajj is all about. It is our fervent wish and our prayer that the Almighty makes it easy for people who have not been on Hajj to undertake this journey. We hold our hands and we pray to the Almighty to give all the people that undertook this journey this year and accepted Hajj. We pray to the Almighty to accept our Hajj. We pray to the Almighty to make it easy for people who have not been on Hajj to undertake this journey. And we pray to the Almighty to forgive all our sins and to really make it easy for us and for everyone else to return to their holy land over and over again. Subhan rabbik rabbil izati hamma yasifoon wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So what you've got here is a collection of 400 pictures that capture the magic moments, that capture the experience, and is then shared with many people so that that experience can be appreciated. And what I like most is that this book that you so uh, successfully auctioned over here, that the 2,000 people that currently, South Africans that currently do the Hajj, there are hundreds of thousands of other Muslims in South Africa that would love to do the Hajj. Some of who can't because of the limitations in numbers of people and some of whom can't because they cannot afford it. They can't even dream of doing the Hajj. And the fact that you're using this opportunity to help people fulfill their dreams, I say thank you to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Yusuf Abramji. I'm in Mina on the outskirts of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Hajj 2016 is drawing to a close. Behind me is the Jamarat where the final day of pelting is taking place. The pilgrims then make their way to the Kaaba in Mecca for the farewell tawaf before heading home. Saudi Arabian authorities need to be complimented for great security and extra security precautions during Hajj 2016. Thank you for being part of my journey. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.